Hello everyone, my name is Chisholm Christensen. I'm a uh, fifth generation rancher in Valley County in the Hinsdale area here. My great great grandfather was Harry Rudder and uh, we're going to share a little story that's uh, a collection of uh, his adventurous life here in the, in the valley, the Milk River Valley, and uh, we'll present cow tales. So I hope you enjoy. Cow Tales. Introduction. This account relates a few of the experiences of a Montana pioneer, Mr. H.J. Rudder, who now lives in Deer Lodge and has lived in the state since 1884. Many of his experiences have been most fascinating, and he has the happy faculty of being able to narrate the colorful phases of his experiences in a vivid and most entertaining manner. In the images that follow are some of the stories as he told them to me. They seem to lose immeasurably without the author's personality to supplement them. They are not in every case the most picturesque experiences, but are chosen from the accuracy of detail and to make a somewhat connected story. The following is a brief sketch of the author's life. Harry J. Rudder was born in Elkhart, Indiana in 1859, of Virginia parentage. In 1877, he went to Texas. In 1884, he came to Montana with a crew that was bringing in a herd of Texas cattle. Since that time, his home, until recently, had been in eastern Montana near Glasgow. He was for some years foreman of the N Bar N Cattle Company, one of the largest outfits in the state. Since the breaking up of the large herds, he has had a ranch of his own and has participated constantly in political and civil activities in Glasgow and in his home community of Hinsdale. He has a great deal of experience over many years in every phase of the cattle business and the rapidly dwindling Montana herds. He is still concerned with brands, but his present work is limited to branding, an inanimate and much less interesting means of transportation, the automobile. He supervises the making, filing, and mailing of state license plates for automobiles. Inmates of the state penitentiary at Deer Lodge furnish most of the labor for this process and in his frequent contacts with the workers, Mr. Rudder has occasionally encountered among the convicts a face whose associations, though vague at first, he has linked with some incident of cattle rustling or banditry of early cattle trail and pioneer days. Perhaps more than any other one person I have met since coming to Montana, Mr. Rudder typifies for me the pioneer character with endless energy to surmount difficulties and lovable optimism that has enabled him to enjoy doing it. The Ghost City. The Ghost City, which we visited a few weeks ago, wasn't far from the location of the well-known Virginia City. It is called Old Blackfoot City. We found a pretty live ghost inhabiting it. As we drove up the cluster of old buildings which enthusiastic spectators have hurried to build there on the mountainside somewhere back in the 60s, the only sign of life was the group of 25 or 30 groundhogs that had been basking in the sun in front of one of the largest and most rickety buildings. With the approach of our car, there was a mad scramble as each of the little animals wanted to get through the same hole in the foundation of the saloon at the same time. Somehow, the silence and the heat waves rising from the old quartz mill and rickety saloon and dance hall suggest ghosts even in broad daylight, and I was beginning to be a little disappointed that there weren't a couple of exploiters left at the mill who might get riled up and show us an old-time gunfight or that no idler rose from the steps of the saloon to challenge us to a poker game. But I wasn't quite prepared for the surprise in the direction from which it came, and as I heard the movement of the brush, I reached for a gun. It must have been the setting that brought back the instinct to draw, because I hadn't worn a holster for years. Of course, there was no gun to draw, and my breath caught a little in the second that elapsed before a bent and tussled creature emerged from the woods. I looked at my companion, and he looked at me, just as dumbfounded as I felt. A grizzly bear or mountain lion wouldn't have surprised us as much as this half-human looking creature did. We stared for some time before we actually realized that this was a man, thin and bent and wrinkled, to an extent that is hardly describable, but a human being nonetheless. It was difficult to approach him and harder to talk to him because he didn't speak English. But a long struggle we found that he was an old Chinaman who claimed to have been there since the gold mining boom of 1862. How an old Chinese cook ever lived through the rise and fall of gold mining camp was more than I could see and he couldn't do much explaining. 
He was quite alone in the city and seemed very content in his isolation. Sky Small named him the mayor, and after we had each contributed a dollar towards a bribe, we managed to get him to pose for his picture and show us around the place. He was using the best of the log houses for his residence. I'm afraid you wouldn't approve of the mayor's manner of keeping house. In fact, I thought myself that it hadn't wanted to use an old suit of underclothes for a tablecloth. He might have washed it occasionally. He did have a dishcloth. That is, one leg of a pair of overalls served, and he told us in the sign language that he washed his dishes on the first day of spring every year, whether they were dirty or not. He had just cut his hair with a butcher knife a few days before we came. The cut was a little uneven, but not so inferior to some I've paid four bits for. The Chinaman had taken a bath once since he had lived there, and that was an accident. He fell in the creek one fourth of July about 25 years ago. It's a shame no one ever taught him to speak English, for you might have heard some real experiences. But I was to tell you some experiences with the Texas trail herd, and here I am, far off on the subjects as usual. Cowboying. Well, I can't claim to be born to the saddle, as some cowmen can. My folks were from Virginia, and I came west with relatives after my father had been killed in the war. There's a loss of memory here, for he was born in Elkhart, Indiana, and for the next sentence, H.J.S., from Ohio, we went to Kansas, where the land grants were generous during the early 70s. Texas Longhorns, Range Country, Gringos, and Saddle and Spurs were imposing sounding terms to me as they were the most every adventurous youth of that day. Branding cattle trails across hills and plains, river country, and arid stretches through buffalo grounds. Indian territory and frontier villages across the 2,000 odd miles from Texas to Montana was a boy's ambition as making trails through the sky is today. My first trip to Texas was in 1877. I was then about 18 and was thrown on my own responsibility. In those days, they could always use men in Texas. I tried to hide my youth and after a while I found a job with a cattle outfit. I took to life in the saddle like a duck takes to water and it wasn't any time until I loved the spirited Bronx and even the ugly Texas Longhorns. One of my first jobs was with the Adling Brothers. They had a ranch on Cow Creek in the Indian Territory and we drove the stock from there to Whitebone, Texas for shipment. In 1878, I was with Hunter Evans and Hunter who supplied beef for the Cheyenne and Comanche Indians at Fort Sill and Fort Reno under contract with the government. After I had been there a couple of years, one of the fellows who was going home to Kansas for a visit persuaded me to go with him. By that time I had accumulated some money and besides I felt a full-fledged cowpuncher and was perhaps thinking of the impression I would make on the folks in Kansas. It was in the early summer of 1879 when we hit the trail north. We packed our bedroll and grub kit light and picked out the best horses we could get. There was no mistaking our profession. Stetsons, ropes, boots, and spurs branded us unmistakably as cowboys. We each had between one and two hundred dollars apiece in our pockets. With all the enthusiasm of youth, we must have felt pretty cocky at the start, and we probably showed it. But before we ended our trip, we weren't so proud. In fact, we were glad to get there alive without bragging that we were cowpunchers. You see, we didn't know what we were getting into in Kansas. You've heard of the Kansas Jayhawks? Well, this fanaticism had taken hold of some otherwise pretty level-headed old-timers. If there was anything unpopular with these Jays, it was a cowboy. We didn't know when we entered the state that we were about as popular as a rattlesnake. The first time we tried to get something to eat, we found out that they were sincere in their dislike. Our money couldn't buy us food. If some of them would have weakened at the sight of money, there were plenty around to see that they weren't violating any rules and regulations. Towns weren't so close together in those days, and by the time we had gone into the second day without finding any place that would sell us food, our stomachs were empty. And it wasn't so pleasant sitting on a horse. Maybe we could have struggled on, but we weren't used to giving our horses a square deal and weren't seeing them go hungry any longer. We were on the trail by four o'clock the third morning. Hunger kept us from sleeping. It was just starting to get light as we were passing one of those Kansas cornfields 
and while one of us watched the road, the other stole into the cornfield and collected enough corn to feed the horses. About the time the horses were getting enough, a cloud of dust that was indicated by the approach of some kind of vehicle appeared down the road and we were on our way. We traveled slow enough to let the coming wagon overtake us, and we were rather surprised to find a traveling peddler going from town to town as late as the 70s. We held a hope for a minute that this traveler might be educated to all the despicable qualities of a cowboy, but this hope was blasted in a hurry when he tried to buy food from him and were refused point blank. There was no use arguing, all that money and we couldn't buy a slice of bread. The trader was about middle age and had whiskers so long and dusty that when he sneezed it started a windstorm and the dust that flew completely obscured the surrounding landscape. Otherwise he wasn't so fierce looking, we thought as he watched him trailed off. We lagged behind to finish feeding the horses and collect a few ears of corn for ourselves. Going along the trail a few minutes later, we thought we saw a smoke line coming up from the bank of a nearby stream. There was nothing to indicate that our trader friend was on the trail ahead of us, and we suspicioned that he had something to do with the faint train of smoke. We decided to do some investigating, but this was safer on foot, so we dismounted and made a careful approach to the bank of the stream. As we came near the little knoll over which the smoke was rising, both Bob and I sniffed the air and gave each other significant glances. Unless our senses were plumb distorted from hunger and fatigue, we were getting a whiff of frying bacon. We quickened our pace. From the top ridge of the knoll, we looked down to the sandy bank below, and there beside a clump of willows was a campfire. Long Whiskers was busy stirring up a mixture that promised to result into pancakes. Bob and I didn't say anything, but we thought plenty. We watched the fire burn up and the first cake sizzle in the bacon fat then an added torture. Out came the coffee pot, and the smell of java mingled with the cakes and bacon. Bob looked at me. What'll we do, he whispered. I didn't hesitate. We are going to eat. We waited a little longer till the stack of cakes looked more imposing. Then I pulled my gun, and with a couple of jumps, we were in the camp, and I had our trader friend covered. He glanced towards the wagon. He wasn't packing a revolver, and there was no time to reach his gun. I thought it was up to me to do some explaining, so I said, Sorry to interrupt your breakfast, partner, but we'd like to borrow those things for a while. While I kept him covered, Bob found the trader's gun, handed me the coffee pot, and picked up the pan of cakes and bacon. We promised to be back, then we backed out of the camp. A little ways down the stream, we found a place to enjoy our breakfast. Figuring he was pretty harmless for the present, I've never had a breakfast that tasted better, and not just because it was acquired at the point of a gun. Well, we returned his property to the top of the knoll because we weren't sure what kind of a reception he might have planned for us. We didn't even stop to thank him. Political strife had made Kansas an undesirable place to live, and I found that most of my family were in Illinois or Indiana, but I myself had no desire to live in the East. In 1880, I was back in Texas with the LX Bar outfit, and I was initiated into cattle trailing proper. We started from their ranch just above Old Adobe Walls for Hunnewell, Kansas, over the Monument Hill Trail. I didn't imagine there would be anything agreeable about trying to feel at home at the end of the trail, terminating in Kansas, and as this was a short trip, I joined a South Texas outfit at Cimarron Ridge Crossing. They were going to deliver a herd to the Pine Ridge Agency at Nebland. The herd was delivered there to the government in November. There was nothing to remain in that part of the country for, so I left Nebland with a very pretentious looking outfit, consisting of a wagon and a four mule team that I had bargained for at the agency. At that time, Deadwood, South Dakota was a mining center, and a number of men interested in it had big cattle interests as well. I stayed at Deadwood during the winter, and in the spring I established connections with the Niobra Cattle Company, which finally brought me to Montana. Trailing North In 1884 came the thrill I had been looking for, to take a herd from Texas and deliver it safely into the Northern Territory. Cattle land in Texas, in spite of the millions of acres of grazing territory, was pretty well taken up by this time and the cattle that could be bred more easily in Texas could be driven north to grow on the fattening grasses of Montana's lonely acres. We started north in 1884, just after the spring breeding season with a herd of about 3,000 head. 
a part of one of the last big cattle drives from Texas. Our herd was about a fourth of the whole herd, which came up in four sections of about 3,000 head each, making about 12,000 head in that drive of 1884. We started from Fort Clark on the Rio Grande, and the first stop was Montage in the Red River. From Montage, the herd took the Monument Hill Trail, which was then through Indian Territory, the part that is now Oklahoma. All cattle starting north on the trail were given a trail brand, and there would be a man left at the central points along the way for a number of days after the herd had passed through. This man would look over the other herds that came in, and he could claim all the cattle bearing the brand of his outfit, no matter who brought them. The way an expert could look over hundreds of head of cattle and classify them according to brands was almost uncanny. Perhaps you've heard of Frank Doby? He's no amateur on brands himself, but he says that Lod Callahan, head inspector for the Texas and SW Cattle Raisers Association at Kansas City Stockyards for some time, could tell what brand an animal had on it by tasting the beef. We had a crew of 10 or 12 cowboys to handle 3,000 head. When it was near time to bed down for the night, the point men would lead the herd off the trail. The swing men would allow the cattle leeway and the herd would start grazing. The trail boss usually had the camp spot picked out hours before it was time to turn off the trail. To be sure of good watering and grazing, I would often lead the herd by as far as 20 miles and cover twice as much territory as when riding herd. Having a watering place spotted, we could judge the rate of speed the herd would have to make. Within about two miles of the camp spot, the crew there would throw them off the trail and the cattle started grazing, and by the time the spot was reached, the cattle were full and the leader was ready to lie down. Then the swing men closed in, and sometimes the entire herd would follow the leader and lie down at once. That was a sight to see, a herd of 3,000 stretched out over several acres. But this was unusual, it was generally a slow job to crowd the herd into the bed ground so gradually that they were all given time to lay down. Besides the crew of cowboys and the trail boss, there was the cook and the horse wrangler. The horse wrangler, usually a young boy, looked after the ramada, which might consist of from five to ten horses to the man. Besides this, he was expected to rustle wood for the cook. Getting firewood on the Kansas Plains wasn't always easy, but on one occasion at least, our wrangler collected it in a hurry. We were out of Oklahoma Territory and headed for Dodge City, Kansas. The rush to settle Kansas during the days of the slavery dispute had been followed with a depopulation reaction and a number of little towns that had had from 150 to 200 people were entirely deserted. On this particular night, I remember having seen one of these well-deserted villages not far from the chosen campsite. When the Wrangler reported to me that there was no timber to be found for the night's fuel supply, I rode up the knoll with him and pointed out the ghost city. There were two irregular rows of dilapidated frame buildings forming a wide street. Through the shadows of the coming twilight, I could make out a huge barrel-like thing that was centered on the town's one street. After looking until my eyes were adjusted to the dark, I made it out to be a rustic old well that really gave character to the spot. The wooden stays that formed the visible frame of the well were still intact, and even the old bucket hung from an arch over the frame. I had almost forgotten our wrangler in picturing the group of languid, contented southerners that I might have seen around the well smoking and basking in the sun had I passed the spot on any summer afternoon before. My wanderings were brought to an abrupt stop when the object causing my fancies was literally jerked from before my eyes and went bounding down the main street, stirring up a cloud of dust that nearly blotted out the town. Our wrangler was the cause of the commotion. While I was dreaming, he had gone down the knoll, trotted around the edge of the slope and entered the town at a gallop. Throwing his lasso as he neared the well, he roped the rustic old structure and continued at a gallop. With the lasso rope tied to the saddle horn, he lifted the well structure from its foundation and it went bounding after him, as he rode out of town in a cloud of dust and disappeared around the knoll to the campsite. I turned my horse and followed him back to camp. He stopped behind the mess wagon, dismounted, and getting the axe, soon had the well housing reduced to a fuel heap. The remaining member of the crew was the cook, and he was a character. His official position, while we were on the trail, was at the helm of the supply wagon. The mess wagon, as we called it, 
often had to be loaded for as many as 300 miles, and that meant a limited supply of everything and careful vigilance on the part of the cook. For most part, the supplies consisted of coffee, bacon, beans, and flour. The coffee that was carried was unparched coffee, bought in 100-pound containers. Part of the kitchen equipment was a Dutch oven, and the cook used this to roast the coffee as was needed. The oven was really built for service and even the familiar beans and bacon weren't so bad when they were baked in it. The fire was burned down to bright coals, then the coals were raked out, and the oven was buried in the embers, full of beans and bacon while the live coals were heaped over it. When the contents were done, the red-hot lid had to be lifted off with long tongs. The cook never had to sound the dinner gong more than once. When we heard the first bang of his big cooking ladle, on the dish pan, we were ready to line up, and by the time the echo was dying away, we were ready for beans and bacon. The daily schedule was much the same. At least we tried to make it the same by overcoming the variable elements we met with along the trail as best we could. During the day, I kept far enough ahead of the herd to know where the next watering hole would be. We tried to regulate the speed of the herd so as to bring them on water at noon. Then we grazed them until two o'clock, the two o'clock threw them back on the trail and would make about seven miles to some dry ridge where we would set up a dry camp. The number of miles the herd could make in one day depended on the grass and water supply. It was usually between 15 and 20 miles a day. Lack of food or water, strange noises, or prowling animals kept up the constant hazard of a stampede at night, so the night watch was a very important part of the trailman's duty. The first guard went on at 10 o'clock the second at midnight, the third at two, and the fourth guard held from four until morning. If a member of the crew was responsible, or rather irresponsible, if he had imagination, if he was highly sensitive, or had a depth of emotion, the night guard brought it out and gave him some of the greatest experiences of his life. Ogallala, Nebraska, a central north and south point in the state, was the farthest north a Mexican would come. This town was a dispersion point. From here, the herds that had been following each other on the trail from Texas scattered out like a fan. Some of the cattle were sold for market. Some were sold to local western and northern ranchers. When we started northwest from Ogallala, we felt like we were really serving connections with our native land. And after we had reached Montana and experienced a few months of that terrible winter of 1884 and 85, we began to think the Mexicans knew what they were doing when they turned back from Ogallala. A short time after we hit the trail northwest from this city, I experienced one of the few incidents of human relationships on the trip. Maybe I should do a little explaining first. You see, in the old trail days, the number of head of cattle slaughtered on one trip would make up a good herd now. There might be as many as a thousand calves born in a good sized herd on one trip, and slowing up, the herd for each one would be out of the question. We couldn't leave them to the wild animals that lurked behind a trail, so the only humane thing to do was to take them from their mothers at birth. But this complicated matters for us. The mother cow would not resign herself to go on without the calf. With every opportunity, she would break from the herd and head back. We met this situation by means of a very modern sounding process, necking. That means that we would bind the mother cow and to steer together by means of a rope fastened around their necks, allowing a space of a couple of feet between. The steer is all for staying in the herd, and the unwilling mother is dragged from the scene of the tragedy, and after about six days is resigned to go on. One night the outfit was making camp at the head of Dry Beaver Creek, northwest from Ogallala, and two creatures appeared that caused a big disturbance in camps. No, not buffalo, nor bears, nor Indians but these two were two very sweet little white girls, and that was a sight so uncommon that the camp had a real excuse for getting excited. Anyone who had ever learned anything about chivalry dusted off his manners and the roughest of the lot were at attention when these girls came into camp. We learned that their father was homesteading on Dry Beaver and that they lived in a lone log cabin that we had entirely overlooked. It was rather a blow to find that they weren't in line to be rescued, but the real blow came when they explained their purpose in coming to camp. We were dumbfounded when one of them said they would love to have some fresh milk. 
The girls just took it for granted that in a herd of that size, milk would be a plentiful object, and that conclusion was quite logical and natural. But to expect to get milk from cows as wild as our Texas trail herd was a terrifying idea to this bunch of trail hands who wouldn't have tackled milking a family pet, let alone these wild creatures. The expressions on the men's faces showed reactions to this absurd request, but there were none of them favorable. Disgust, disappointment, wonder, and amusement. No one showed much inclination of ever considering complying with it. The disillusioned men of the girls was no less evident. If they had had any experience with cowboys before, they must have thought that this was just a dumber bunch than usual. When I saw the embarrassment that our hesitation was causing the girls, I felt ashamed for all of us. I didn't know anything about milking cows myself, but something in me said I couldn't let the girls think that because we were cowboys and seldom had a chance to associate with women, we didn't know how to treat them. I explained to them that these cows were never milked, but that when the herd was bedded down, I would do my best to get some milk. There were several cows that had to be necked that night, and I made up my mind to make an attempt at any cost to get the milk. Kitchen utensils were at a premium, as were any manufactured articles in the wilderness. I dreaded tackling the cows for milk. Finally, I managed to get a hold of an old lard pail, and I took it with me as we rode out to the herd. The boys looked at me sideways, and I wasn't flattered at the implications in their glances. I could feel Jed's eyes, plumb local, he was thinking. We hogtied and threw the cows and steers to be necked, then tied them together. This didn't help the animals' dispositions. The fellows were pretty decent about roping the cow for me. I knew they were interested in my efforts, and I knew that at some distance the girls were staring wide-eyed at this unique demonstration of milking a cow. It would have been a bad influence on the animal for me to show nervousness, and I went to it like I knew all about milking. I don't know what happened, but I got what I wanted, though lots of it was wasted on the prairie before I managed to hit the lard pail. When I had the pail full, I was pretty warm. I hurried to get away from the vicinity of the cows before she got really unfriendly. It had been such a trifling matter to make such a fuss about, I hardly knew quite how to act. I felt the surge of satisfaction that came from knowing I had so easily accomplished what was to the others beyond possibility, or at least was below their dignity to attempt in public. I realized that all eyes in camp were focused on me, and an impulse to finish the act with a flourish swept over me as I approached my horse. If I had been acting according to reason, I would have noticed the attitude of my horse and have taken precautions. But just then I was primarily concerned with the figure I was cutting, and if I saw the distended nostrils and wild eyes of the horse I was about to mount, they didn't register. Taking hold of the pommel of the saddle, I held the lard pail in my right hand as I swung into the saddle. I cleared the horse's flanks with a wide swing of my right arm and fell into the saddle with a bow befitting a circus performer. The milk pail fell into place at my side with the contents almost intact. But the difference between almost and all in this case was immense. The few splashes of milk that lapsed over onto the horse was all that he needed to set off his already high pitch of excitement. He was off like he had been given pointed spurs, and I came out of my revere with a jolt that lifted me several feet in the air. I came down again on the saddle and concentrated on holding the milk pail right side up. With each bound of the horse, the milk splashed higher, and with each splash, the horse was aggravated again. As a general rule, I ride with my horse, but this time I was every place he wasn't. With a particularly violent leap, he sent the milk pail and me flying into space. I lived, but right at the time, I wouldn't have cared if I didn't. I couldn't really tell you how many different things I was concerned about when I came to, but the first thing I concentrated on was the empty milk pail. You think a bunch of college fellows can give you a razz? Well, you haven't had experience with cowboys. I gritted my teeth and tried not to listen to what they were saying, picked up the empty lard pail, walked back to the herd, and managed to get another pail of milk. Things don't bother me usually, but I must have been the picture of embarrassment when I walked that gauntlet of railing cowboys to hand the pail to those girls. That night as we sat around the campfire, there were plenty of wisecracks circulating about Knights of the Floating Milk Pail, Our Mounted Milkmaid, and the Dairy Hero, and worse. 
I was smiling in spite of my aches, but the source of amusement wasn't the wisecracking I was trying not to hear as I looked into the fire and saw the understanding faces of the two sisters. And I was hearing again the shorter girl say after she thanked me for the milk, don't mind what these men say, I'm sorry and I hope you're not hurt. The trail into Montana led through Fort Keogh and Mile City, and from here we headed for the mouth of the Muscle Shell River on the bank of the Missouri. Our section was the first of the big herd to take advantage of the northern pastures. We made our camp about the first of November. Buffalo. The last of the big herds of buffalo had been killed off in this territory in 1881 and 1882. It seems remarkable at first thought that the great herds which grazed over thousands of acres of Montana grasslands in the 70s should be reduced to a few scattered groups of lone specimens by the 80s. But it is not so much a matter of wonder when you are acquainted with the manner of buffalo hunting in the 70s. It was a very profitable commercial affair and the methods used were most efficient. Take the partnership of Carpenter and Gribson, for instance. They would establish their camp in a thickly populated buffalo country. The partners were the killers and they would hire a crew of about 12 men as professional skinners. Having established themselves in a buffalo area, the two leaders scouted until they located a herd on a big flat. If the wind was from the east, the killers would work around to the west side of the herd. Equipped with rest sticks, heavy guns, and ammunition, the men would dismount a mile from the buffalo and approach with extreme caution to a point where they might be visible to the animals. From here, perhaps 500 yards, they would crawl on their stomachs to within 150 or 200 yards of the edge of the herd. Here they would set up their rest sticks. These consisted of two sticks crossed about two thirds of the way up and bound together at this point with a buffalo thong. When they set up in the ground, the rest sticks formed a rest for the heavy guns and ensured steady aim. The gun rest was very essential for the steadiest shot when you consider that they often waited a half an hour for the shot they wanted. If you know the habits of buffalo, you understand why the men had to be sure of their shots. If the first failed to kill a buffalo but wounded him, he would start a deafening bellow and start running. That was the cue for the rest of the herd, and they would be off at a gallop and the hunting for that day would be over. For these experts, there wasn't much danger at the first crack off the barrel, not being a dead shot. If the first shot broke the buffalo's neck or back or pierced his heart, he would fall without a struggle and other animals at the scent of blood would mill around the dead one in confusion. The rest of the marksman task was simple. If the herd was a large one, the killers might shoot down 200 animals before the herd was broken up. If the herd consisted of from 25 to 150, the hunters would probably drop them all on the spot in one. When the slaughter was finished, the killers moved on to locate another herd. The paid skinners went to work on the dead herd and there was no time lost. The only meat used from all this accumulation of flesh was the tongues and humps. The hunting party used the humps and the tongues were shipped to the Eastern markets. The skinners carried a sack of pegs and after skinning a buffalo, they turned the hide flesh side up in the sun, pegged it down, and allowed it to dry. In a month's hunt, these men would amass 1,000 buffalo hides. The hides were piled on a hay rack and taken to the head camp, which would probably be on the Missouri River, and from here they were shipped down the Missouri and Mississippi to St. Louis or New Orleans and sold at a good profit. The buffalo bones left to bleach on the plains were often gathered some time later by the breeds of the locality. While we were exploring for a campsite in 84, I was investigating in the Seven Blackfoot area. I came out of the mouth of Hell Creek, where it enters the Missouri, and there on the banks of the Missouri was a solid wall of bones, about 300 feet high, 20 feet wide, and piled as high as bones could be thrown. These bones had been carried to the riverbank by the breeds after the great hunt of 81 and 82. During the years when buffalo hunting was at its height, steamboats came up the Missouri from St. Louis, loaded tons of bones and carried them back to Mississippi markets. But in 1883, the coming of the railroad into the Missouri River country made it impossible for the steamboats to carry enough tons of bones to compete with the railroads. They had inevitably come to this conclusion without giving the breeds any forewarning. For this great wall of bones laboriously arranged on the riverbank was still awaiting the coming of a steamboat from St. Louis. 
The next year I was passing the mouth of Hell Creek again, and I looked for the wall of bones. I had found the preceding year. But the turbulent Missouri had shifted its course. Besides changing the mouth of the creek, the opposite banks of the Missouri had been undermined by the churning waters, and as it caved in the heap of bones had also been carried away, and the dark waters of the Missouri rushed over the spot where the white wall had stood only a year before. When the Great Northern Railway was built west from Glasgow in 1887, the company located a store at Hinsdale, which at th that time was a mile east of the present site. The company bought bones from the breeds and hauled them to the Hinsdale store. Then the company shipped them east. Buffalo bones were used in those days in a clarifying process in eastern sugar factories, but don't let that bother you because the process is as obsolete as the great buffalo herds. This wholesale collection of bones accounts for the fact that there are so few traces of buffalo remains around Hinsdale, a district that was once one of the greatest buffalo hunting areas in Montana. It was in the winter of 1885 when the Enbar men had a horse camp near Sand Creek on the northern edge of Porcupine Buttes that I ran across W.T. Hornaday, the scientist. He was doing still hunting for the Smithsonian Institute and had established his camp on the southern edge of the Buttes. At this early date, the disappearance of the American buffalo was anticipated and the Institute had selected this part of the country as the place to find choice specimens. Hornaday made his preparations for mounting at this spot and some of his specimens proved to be the best collected and are now on exhibit. Winter. My first winter in Montana was a memorable one. The mussel shell region that had been in the center of the buffalo hunters turned out to be a hangout for cattle rustlers by 1884. There were a number of men there that had been dependent on buffalo hunting for a living. As the last of the herds were killed off, many of these men became woodhawks. That is, they made a business of cutting cordwood and of exchanging it for supplies that the steamboats brought up the Missouri from St. Louis. This business was slow and rather unprofitable, and by 82 and 83, a number of them were aligned in stealing cattle. The biggest ranch in the vicinity was the ranch at Fort McGinnis, belonging to Granville Stewart and Reese Anderson and their brand was the DHS. The cattle rustling business was playing havoc with the DHS herd, which ranged over acres and acreages of wild, unfenced country. The DHS outfit took it upon itself to organize a vigilante committee. This committee was headed by Flopping Bill, an old buffalo hunter and experienced woodsman who had obtained his subsequent through a trick he had of turning his double-bladed ax over in the air after every stroke. The work of the vigilante committee was rapid and thorough. During the spring and summer of 1883, they hanged or shot 23 men on the banks of the Missouri near the head of the mussel shell. Among the victims were the Downey brothers, who had been running a store and a big supply station at the fork of the Missouri in the mussel shell. When our herd reached the site of the store on October 20th, 1884, the only remains besides the store building itself was a pile of beer bottles as high as the house. I don't know how many boxes of cartridges were used polishing off marksmanship by tossing the beer bottles into the Missouri and shooting off the neck just as one appeared on the surface of the water. Evidently, there was not too much Irish blood in this group of cowboys. At least the ghosts of the Downey brothers did not haunt them. Camp was set with the old Downsy store building as headquarters. The men set to work immediately to cut cottonwood logs and build corrals at the mouth of large Creek a mile up the mussel shell. Johnny Burgess, the manager of Nebman's outfit, had a brand legally registered and the work of branding was begun. By the time the fall work was done, the winter had set in. I've been in Montana 40 years or more now, and I haven't known a colder winter than that of the 1884. There had been no time to gather hay that fall, and the outfit lived in hope that the light snows occasionally removed by a Chinook would make it possible for the cattle to winter on buffalo grass. A supply of oats was put in to feed the saddle horses. However, it was quite evident that the supply was not going to fill the demands of our armada of Texas horses, whose appetites were being fawned by wintry Montana winds. All but three or four horses were finally turned loose to shift for themselves in the hills surrounding the ranch. Regardless of this precaution, the supply of oats had run out by the 1st of January. 
A thermometer was not part of the M-Bar equipment, and although the southern bred cowboy knew that this was no Texas winter, they did not realize what extremes a thermometer would have reached in this particular January. However, Johnny Burgess did know that he wasn't going to let the stock that remained with us starve. He knew that a fall steamboat load of oats shipped to Rocky Point, 45 miles up the Missouri. He decided that someone in the outfit must take the trip to Rocky Point. He had a Hans Hansen in the bunch who came out to Mile City that fall to trap along the Missouri. Hans had fulfilled his purpose in coming to the extent of some 60 beaver pelts, a number of coyote, wolf, and antelope hides, and he was anxious to get his find collected to market and realize the big financial return such heavy pelts were bound to bring. I wasn't hankering much to be out of doors, but I was ready to try anything for a variation from the regular routine. Hanson and I volunteered, and Burgess was ready to go with us. It was the first of January when we hitched up two wagons, put in a camping outfit, and started for Rocky Point. The ranch headquarters was located on the slope between the Missouri River and a clump of pine trees which grew along the ridge of the slope itself parallel to the river. The snow was deep on the slope itself and there was no trail. For guidance and protection we turned to the ridge. The bulky open frame wagons creaked along the ridge and the brittle sounds they made all that broke on the awful silence. I don't believe going to exile in Siberia could be much more terrifying. At the close of the first day, we pulled off the ridge into the wide bottom sag full of pines. We were desperately cold and with unusual speed, we managed to collect a pile of pine logs. We piled about 15 up in the clearing in record time and started a fire in the center of the pile. And as long burned through the center, we would throw the two ends into the fire and keep our fire renewed. As soon as we took the harness off a horse, we had to hurry to rub him down to keep the moist parts of him from freezing. The way we made our bed that night was a matter of life and death. First, we cleared away two foot of snow from a space on the ground large enough to spread about half the length of an 18 foot tarpaulin. Burgess and I had a cowpuncher's mattress. This was rather thin padding hinged through the center so that it could be doubled to soften a bed for one cowboy or extended when necessary to accommodate two men. We spread the mattress on the tarp and each of us hauled out our 12 pairs of blankets for bedding. We drove stakes in the snow above the head of the bed and pulled the tarp back over the entire bed and rested it on the stakes. All our equipment, including our saddles, were protected under the tarp. Hansen had it over us for that night, at least as far as warm and luxurious beds were concerned. He hauled out his pile of pelts and slept in a bed of fur a foot thick. We drove hard all the next day and urged on because of the cold we kept going after dark. It got to be about nine o'clock at night and although we were stricken to the ridge, we were beginning to wonder a light about directions when we saw a few dim lights of Rocky Point, known today as Wilder's Ferry. We reached the store feeling pretty numb and not knowing much what it was all about. When we came, they told us that the thermometer was registering 57 below zero. I had to look at the thermometer for myself, and when I saw it, I almost stiffened out again. We didn't have the advantage of radio to antiquate us with what was going on on the other side of the world. There wasn't even a telegraph or telephone there at the time. But sometime later, we saw a government report from the Poplar Indian Reservation just north of us, and the temperature recorded for that night was 66 below zero. Then the temperature rose to reasonable near zero. We loaded the wagons with the coveted oats and started home over the frozen waters of the Missouri. The most tragic part of that winter was the effect of the cattle. The Texas bred cattle didn't know what it was all about and we lost almost the entire herd through an unusual situation connected with the earlier history of the place. It seems that the English were having terrible times trying to bring the breeds of Western Canada to accustom themselves to civil law. There were constant uprisings among the French Indian breeds, which became a regular war in the early 70s. The morale of the breeds was broke when their leader, Ryle, and eight of his companions were hung. Other leaders escaped south into the United States and made settlements along the Muscle Shell. Their method of setting up a village was rather unusual. One family would build a three-walled shack about 16 by 20 feet of cottonwood logs. 
and the next family would build three walls onto the first dwelling. There might be seven or eight extensions to the original three walls. In this way, each family saved the labor of building the fourth wall. But evidently, the breeds were not so well pleased with this part of the country, or they felt the ties of their native Canada too strong for them to resist. At any rate, when the controversy in Canada was settled, they started drifting back home. And when we came to the Mussel Shell in 84, the shacks were all deserted. About Christmas time, I was riding up the river to check up on the cattle, and I found that the animals had come upon a beaver who had built their homes according to the usual water line, found that the icy water was rushing through their homes, and they were forced out. When they came out of their houses, they would sit on the banks in groups of five or six, as if holding counsel on the bewildering occurrence that was so violently disturbing their usual winter home. They would let you come so close that you could hear their teeth chatter before they would take the plunge into the icy waters. Being thrown out of a home in the middle of January with the temperature far below zero and the ground solidly froze must have been pretty disheartening, but with the energy characteristic of beaver, they would go below the ice and begin burrowing a new home in the bank. They would have been the winner to gather hides for a fur coat, and maybe I would have been doing them a favor, but I couldn't take advantage of them. I've always had my Winchester with me in the open, and I have had occasion to drill deer, buffalo, elk, and antelope, and once a mountain lion, but it has always been for food or protection, and never for mere destruction. In 1885, I made my first trip into northern Montana, scouting for Newman. Charles Razor was with me. He was scouting for the Lee Scott Cattle Company. Each of us had two pack and two saddle horses to make the trip into this country. I struck a deep coulee running into Milk River near Hinsdale, and I explored the milk from St. Mary's to the mouth and returned to report Newman as fine a grazing country as could be found. Side note, this deep coulee hit by a rudder in 1885 is believed to be Tank Coulee, a place where my family homesteaded and still runs cattle to this day. This valley had been for years for hunting grounds of the Gross Venture, the Blackfoot, the Pegans, and the Bloods. There was abundant game even when I was there and Joe Butch, who trapped and hunted in the 60s and 70s, had seen some local histories, saw antelopes so thick in the bottoms between the Missouri and the Milk that you couldn't shirt your way through them. He and a trapper by name of Hammond had wolves piled up by the hundreds one winter, waiting to skin them in the spring and ship them up the Missouri. But the Indians got rather familiar and the hunters moved on to the fort. There were no Indian uprisings after 1876. And when I went through in 85, the Indians were on the reservation. The Great Northern was just building in Dakota and Milk River Valley was a wilderness. I went back and reported to Newman the rich grazing lands as I had ever gone over. The next winter, we were located about 110 miles from Mile City, without even a stagecoach to come within 70 miles with the mail. About every two weeks, someone went for mail, that is, when the weather permitted. It was a distance of about 90 miles on horseback, sometimes with no returns. I have seen the trip made to Mile City, 110 miles in one day with one horse, and the same horse carried me back over the distance the next day. We didn't often get to Mile City, but when we did, the town certainly knew we were there. There was a singing cowboy in our outfit who went by the nickname of Teddy Blue. That was all I ever heard him called, although his name was Abbott. He spent most of his evenings making up words and tunes and putting them together. On one of the trips to Mile City, after being isolated on the ranch for months, Teddy Blue was feeling especially enthusiastic about his entertaining abilities, and he decided to give the town folks a treat. He went up to the theater of the village and told the proprietor that he had a song he'd like to sing for the folks. The proprietor hesitated, but for some reason he didn't voice an objection. All right, he said. Teddy told him it was a brand new song and he'd like to introduce it on horseback. Then, without waiting for objections, Teddy mounted his horse and rode into the theater and up the aisle. Before the audience knew what was happening, he had jumped his mount to the stage, doffed his hat, and with a sweeping bow, he let go on a cowboy song that nearly raised the roof of the theater. In 1887, I was taking a beef herd from the Little Powder country to the Cheyenne Agency. The trail was along the East Fork of the Little Powder, and one night we made camp in the shelter of some sand dunes. 
When we went to exploring for firewood, we found that the dunes were in a basin surrounded by pine hills. Among the hills and not far from where we had made camp, we found a coulee lined with petrified logs. This set us to looking around for more discoveries. Most of the dunes were grazed over, showing that the wind had not shifted them for some time. However, the wind cutting down through a gulch in the hills had slowly worked on one of the dunes cutting off the top of it. One of the fellows went investigating in the hollow of the dune and came across a skeleton that didn't look like anything he had ever seen before. He knew better than to come back and tell us about it and expect us to believe it. He called us over to see for ourselves. The skeleton was between 20 and 25 feet long and most of the bones seemed to be intact. The bones indicated a pointed head, a long neck, and a tapering tail, and we accused it of being a dinosaur. The bones of the spinal column showed a fan-shaped formation, just back of the shoulders making a hump similar to a buffalo hump, but much larger. No one could suggest a plausible reason why the bones had not been shifted or disarranged in the shift of the sand years before, and we regretted that Hornaday and his hunt for choice specimens of buffalo had not come upon this spot. The winter of 1886 and 87 was a memorable one for cattlemen in Montana. It was not so cold as it had been in 85, but there was more snow and the cattle couldn't find feed. Big cattle companies who had brought thousands of head of Texas cattle into Montana the preceding summer found themselves facing bankruptcy the next spring. In some cases, whole herds were wiped out. Newman's herd had been reduced from about 60,000 head to a little better than 9,000 by the ravaging winter and sold out to Tommy Cruz, a Helena banker and well-known stock and sheepman of Fergus County. In 1889, Nidoringus brothers put about 30,000 head on a ranch in Valley County on Rock Creek. In the country I had been through a few years before and I went to work for them as a range foreman on that ranch. That time the Homeland and Cattle Company, as the Nidoringus brothers outfit was called, was one of the largest in this part of the country. There must have been 80,000 head in their grazing territory that extended from Missouri to Canada, east to Dakota, and west to the head of the Muscle Shell, bearing the N bar N brand. They were almost as well known for their unusually large stock of horses. At one time, we collected all the horses we could round up to be broken. It was a big job, but breaking horses was my long suit. And when we had finished, the boss must have been satisfied with the result. Anyhow, he gave me 15 of the choice animals of the bunch. In 1891, I got back on the trail again, this time for a trail boss for a crew that took 1,600 head of horses into the cattle country near Windor, Wyoming, and brought back 30,000 head of cattle. To me, Milk River Valley country has always been an ideal range country, and always will be. The wide stretch of open range area and the quality of the soil, combined with the climatic conditions, was producing ideal feed for thousands of buffalo, which grazed over the country before the days of the big killings. That region today, with its 40,000 acres and the irrigation project underway, is well known for the famous blue joint hay, as good a cattle feed as can be found and commands a high price any time. But for grain production, well, I'm just a biased old cattleman and anything I say won't bring back the long-legged, very colored, untamed longhorns that we brought into the valley to supplant the buffalo. There were a number of reasons for the rather sudden disappearance of the big herds from this part of Montana. One of the main factors, I do believe, was this part of the country was the last of Montana's grazing area to be taken up as cow country. Our herds in 84 were about the last of the big herds out of Texas and the first into the Milk River Valley area. By the time the business was well established, the price of beef was going down and some of the stockmen were overly anxious to sell. Then our outfit by 95 was becoming pretty corrupt. A group of men from Texas came into control of our outfit. There was Steve Roop who came to the Big Dry in 85 with a herd of Texas cattle. At that time he went by the name of Harry Arnold because he had been mixed up in a killing scrape in Texas. In 86 or 87, he went back to Texas to stand trial. Some uncle with money to back him managed to get Steve out of it. The next year, Steve and a group of associates came up into our country with some Texas cattle. They landed jobs with our outfit and stayed. Some of his colleagues were Broom, 
Coffer and Jim Snearley. And there seemed to be no way of telling what men were in cahoots with Bill Hardy and the big cattle rustler of that era. But though the law couldn't reach them, they managed to thin out their number by the survival of the fittest process. Jim Snearley's boy, just a kid at the time, went to the Dakotas with Hardy to sell a bunch of horses that the rustlers had taken from Valley County Stockmen. After the horses had been sold, Hardy and young Snearley got into an argument about the division of the money and Hardy shot the boy. Besides rustlers and the low price of cattle, there was an immigration from Minnesota and Dakota of foreigners in search of agricultural lands, a movement which encouraged the former settlers also to try grain farming. The final breakup of the Niederingus Company came in 1897 and was a rather inglorious finish. The manager, Lost Blackburn, I believe allowed himself to be roped in on an ingenious plan contract with the West Cattle Company of McNamara and Marlowe. The contract specified that the Rock Creek Company was to supply 6,000 head of beef in the spring of 97 to McNamara and Marlowe. The cattle were to be loaded at Oswego and the western buyers were to pay the cost of shipping to Big Sandy. But the catch clause in the contract was this. For every head under 6,000 that Blackburn failed to furnish, he was to pay a forfeit of $20. It was a ridiculous situation, but it never occurred to Blackburn that he couldn't collect 6,000 head of cattle from the thousands of acres in his territory after the range had been so recently stocked with 30,000 head. But when spring came, the outfit hunted every coolie and shrub and managed to gather just 2,400 head to ship. McNamara and Marlowe, instead of paying the freight, left it to be collected from the Eastern Cattle Company. Because, as their contract showed, that company, after shipping about 2,500 head of cattle, still owed them $20 apiece for every additional head up to 6,000 that they failed to furnish. The case went to court, of course, even to a federal court, and Nybronners had the satisfaction of winning in court, although it was an expensive victory. The Girl I was sorry to have the company go out in this way after my years of connection with it, but there was something on my mind at that time that was more important to me than any business in the country. I was making plans for a home and I was anxious to be independent. I filed a homestead in a desirable section of Rock Creek in 97, and I already had part interest in a horse ranch, which was paying well because of the increased demand for broke horses in the newly settled agricultural areas of Dakota and Montana. It was not difficult to accumulate a respectable stock of cattle, and I filed the brand AW on the left shoulder called the Lazy EA. In 1893, I complicated things further by accepting the appointment to the office of deputy sheriff under Sky Small at Glasgow. With the county still alive with cattle thieves and a nest of train robbers, that job was a lively and absorbing affair, and it kept me worried. Not over it, but because it kept me so busy I was afraid of losing out on other projects I was interested in and getting a home. As I said, I had the means for the home and the location for the house was all picked out, but the house didn't make a home. I was worried about the girl. It is true that this was a new country and girls were few, but that wasn't bothering me. I had my girl all picked out and I wouldn't have taken a substitute if I had had all New York instead of Glasgow to pick one from. She had come west with her mother and father when the Great Northern built through Glasgow. Her father was a construction engineer with the company and with the continental expansion of the road, he found it worthwhile to locate permanently. Elsie, his daughter, who later became my wife, was all wrapped up in the idea of getting a county school district organized. She was more enthusiastic about the barefoot youngsters and she was teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic in the town hall at Hinsdale than she was about any of the boys that came around to annoy her in the evenings. I didn't give in though and finally something happened that seemed to help her decide. We had been having more trouble with Hardy and his band of thieves and I had been gone with the posse from Glasgow for days and hadn't sent any word to Elsie who was teaching school at Hinsdale about 30 miles away. When I finally came in from the trail I reported at Glasgow and was tired after several days in the saddle and nights too but I didn't unsaddle. I kept on going until I reached Hinsdale early in the evening. 
This was one time I was really relieved to get out of the saddle. I tried to brush up a little, then I went to call on Elsie, only to be told she had gone to a dance at Seiko that evening. Seiko was 14 miles away, but I wasn't in the frame of mind to hesitate. I jumped right back into the saddle and was on the trail again as fast as a poor horse could travel. That was the longest 14 miles I've ever covered in the saddle. I got there before the dance was over and this time I didn't wait to brush off. I went right to the dance hall and found the Hinsdale crowd. There wasn't any use to talk to Elsie. I settled in with her escort and in a little while she was apologizing for having a broken axle on his wagon. I offered to take her home and did so a little while later in the same wagon she had come in. The rest of the crowd made plenty of insinuations but Elsie didn't say much, whatever she thought. Anyway, before the next dance we were engaged and that summer of 1899 we were married. After that, I could concentrate with better peace of mind on ridding the locality of the lawless class. They were holding us hostage from becoming civilized. Hardy wasn't jailed until 1903. He was one of the last big ringleaders. We had him in the death cell to be hung for a whole series of crimes when he made his last break for life and that almost ended mine. But the story of how he schemed with four others to get Harry Cosner the sheriff and probably myself and how we trailed them to the hills and won is a story in itself. We'll leave that for later.